Hi, it's me, and today I have something quite unique for you, as you can see, it is the Minolta Rokor 40-80mm f2.8, and it comes in either MC or MD varieties, they're both essentially the same, it's a slightly different mount. Now, this is a well-known collector's lens from the 1970s, and this is the first technical full review of it you'll be able to find on the internet today, I think. Back in 1975, when this thing was first marketed, there were a number of zoom lenses available in the world, but they were nothing like they are today. They were generally quite large and had low image quality and mediocre maximum apertures and zoom ranges. The difficulty lay in producing a zoom mechanism that adjusted all the lens's internal glass elements with the correct precision needed to correct for optical aberrations, which is a mechanical feat of engineering that we take for granted nowadays in the days of computer-aided design, but for engineers in the 1970s with their slide rules and safari suits, it was an incredibly difficult task. A real challenge came in adjusting the lens's internal elements using a helicoid within the lens barrel. So, Minolta's engineers decided to think outside the box, quite literally in this case, and design a zoom lens where the optics could be adjusted using a gearbox attached to the outside of the lens, which leads us to Exhibit A. This lens's design allowed for its glass elements to be adjusted with more precision than previous designs and, at the same time, it was hailed for its impressive resulting image quality. If you want to find out a bit more, then Roger from Lens Rentals did an amazing teardown of this thing, and I'll put a link to his article in the description below. Even today, this lens's good reputation carries on, and it has become a true collector's item. Well, for those who have actually heard about it anyway. It can be found for about seven to eight hundred dollars on eBay for a decent copy, and of course, you'll need an appropriate adapter to get the thing onto whatever camera you're using. Let's take a look at the lens itself first. It's a bit smaller than you might expect for an f2.8 standard zoom, although admittedly, 40mm is hardly a very wide angle to be starting from. It weighs about half a kilo, just over a pound, and it's made of a mixture of metal and plastic, with a leatherette finish around the middle, which has gone hard over the past 54 years or so. This is obviously a completely manual lens, manual focus, manual aperture, the aperture is controlled from the rear, there are clicks at every half an f-stop, except between f2.8 and f4 where there's no click at all, and the aperture mechanism has six iris blades, yielding awkward bokeh when stopped down, but pretty sun stars. The zoom and focus controls can be found at the side. Turn the lever in the middle to control the zoom, and the focus ring surrounds it, turning smoothly and precisely. Controlling the lens from its side like this is quite an experience. It's fun to try something different, but obviously it'll slow you down a lot while shooting. The lens displays some pretty clear focus breathing when you're zoomed in, but it's less pronounced when you zoom out. The lens has a dedicated macro mode. If you turn this little metal knob and push it into the lens's body, then that will engage a macro mode when shooting at 40mm. It's nowhere near being a true macro mode, really. It's just the only way to shoot closer than about 1 meter from your subject with this lens. The front filter size of the lens is 55mm wide, and it comes with a thin rubber hood. My one's a little worse for wear here, as you can see. Overall though, the lens's build quality is quite lovely, although as I mentioned, its mechanics do take getting used to. So, let's move on and take a look at this supposedly legendary image quality. I'll be testing it, adapted onto my Canon EOS R5 with its 45 megapixel sensor, and thereby putting the lens under the kind of challenge its original engineers probably never even dreamed would exist. There are no image corrections in these pictures. At 40mm and f2.8, the lens is decently sharp in the middle, with no purple fringing. Contrast here is just okay, though. Over in the corners, image quality quickly and decidedly falls apart. Stop down to f4 for just a little more clarity there, and back in the middle, there's a lot more contrast now. Stop down to f5.6 and sharpness becomes excellent in the middle. The corners are still looking very soft though, with very strong chromatic aberration. 
stopped down to F8 for a major improvement and at F11 those corners look pretty sharp. There's still some colour fringing to be seen but it's not as bad as usual for a zoom lens from the mid 70s, here's F16. So it's a shaky start at 40mm. Let's zoom in a bit now to 60mm. In the middle we see very good sharpness and still no purple fringing, but contrast has become a little more hazy. Over in the corners we see plenty of softness, although that chromatic aberration is now gone. Stop down to F4 for more brightness in those corners and there's plenty of contrast back in the middle now. At F5.6 image quality in the middle is perfect, but the corners are still very soft. Here's F8 and F11 which both see gradual improvements. Finally let's zoom all the way into 80mm. Again at F2.8 sharpness remains good but contrast is low, leaving to a rather ghostly looking image. Again at F2.8 the corner image quality is extremely soft, at F4 the corners are the same but brighter, but image quality in the middle sees a very dramatic improvement in contrast. At F5.6 the middle remains perfect, the corners remain very soft. At F8 the image finally begins to get a little clearer. At F11 image quality is as good as it gets in the corners. Overall, for a camera lens in 2021 this would obviously be a very poor performance, but in 1975 this would have been better than average, zoom lenses of that era would have been even softer and certainly would have had more purple fringing and chromatic aberration in their image corners. Now let's move on and look at vignetting and distortion. 40mm may not be a particularly wide angle, but we are treated to heavy barrel distortion here nonetheless. At f2.8 the corners are also very dark, at f4 and f5.6 though they brighten up considerably. When zooming in to 80mm we are treated to some moderate pincushion distortion and again heavy vignetting at f2.8. This must have been so discouraging to work with in the film era when editing your images would have been so difficult. Anyway again at f4 and f5.6 those corners brighten up. During normal shooting the lens's minimum focus distance is about 1 meter, which is terrible, but in macro mode at 40 mm it's about 33 centimeters, which is much better. That close up image quality in macro mode is a bit softer with some purple fringing at f2.8, stop down to f4 for a major improvement in contrast and the purple fringing is gone, f5.6 looks very nice and sharp, close up. Now let's see how the lens works against bright light. Well this is a lens from 1975, there are as many flares to be seen here as in a San Francisco clothes shop of the same time and the flaring gets worse as you zoom in. However I will say this, it does actually look incredibly pretty. Now let's take a look at this lens's bokeh. Generally it is fantastically smooth and beautiful, particularly for a zoom lens of the time with nice character. One issue is that the lens is particularly susceptible to cat's eye bokeh shapes in its image corners. And finally related to bokeh, let's take a look at this lens's longitudinal chromatic aberration. It's pretty strong at f2.8 as you can see, however stop down to f4 and any of that colour fringing is quickly gone. Overall, well if you were hoping this might be some kind of magic lens from the 70s offering modern image quality with optics ahead of their time then, well forget it, although in its time it would have been quite impressive. However it still has a lot going for it, its photos have a real character to them, low contrast maybe but with lovely colours and beautiful bokeh and some people might be quite attracted to its beautiful albeit rather extreme flaring patterns and it's certainly a curious thing to use on your camera, it's been sitting on my desk now for a while and I always find myself absent mindedly playing with its controls. I'm not convinced the thing is worth $700, but it does have the most character of almost any lens I've ever used before. Thanks for watching everyone. Unusual reviews of lenses like this and many others cost quite a bit of time and money for me, I love putting them together for you, but if you'd like to support the channel and keep these reviews coming then check out my Patreon page, there is a link in the description below. There you can find all kinds of exclusive content, news and early access for supporters. Take care now and God bless.